you were in Sunday school this morning in your Sunday school class, the Sunday school lesson bore out the fact that 70% of people who profess to be Christians, 70% of people who profess to be Christians believe that there's more ways to get to heaven than through Jesus Christ. Can you only imagine in a world of 8 billion people, if 2 billion people profess to be, say that Jesus is in their hearts and in their lives, and we know there are some 2 billion, 2.3, 2.7, somewhere in that neighborhood of people that say that they know Jesus as their personal Lord and Savior. If we only took 2 billion and multiplied that times 70%, that tells you how many people believe that there's more ways to get to heaven than through Jesus, and that would be 1.4 billion out of 2 billion people. That would leave only 600,000, basing it upon that statistical data of 2 billion people that would say that Jesus is the only way to get to heaven. You and I live in a world today where people are offended by the exclusivity of saying that Jesus is the only way to get to heaven. Well, folks, I want you to know this morning, if you believe the Bible, I believe, and I believe it by faith. Jesus, Jesus said in John 14, I am the way, I am the truth, I am the life. No man comes to the Father except through me. Would you stand as we pray together this morning? Father God, as we pause in these next few moments, I pray that you would arrest our attention, O oh God, upon 1 John chapter 1, verses 1 through 4. Father, I pray that you would let us hear the testimony of John, who had a first account witness, an eyewitness of who you truly are. I pray, O oh God, that you would open our eyes, open our ears, help us this day to grasp the importance of knowing that we know for sure, that we know for sure that Jesus is real to us. In Christ's name we pray. And all God's people said, amen. Thank you. You may be seated. I read young people just this past week. This is staggering to know. I read this past week where 200 people every second worldwide Google in their search engine this question, is God real? 200 people worldwide every second Google in their search engine, is God real? Whenever I read that, I could not help but remember a statistic that I read this past week that said that every 40 seconds worldwide, every 40 seconds, someone commits suicide. People all over the world this morning are looking, longing, searching, looking for meaning, looking for significance, looking for purpose in their lives. And one of the things this morning that I want us to listen in on is John's testimony. One of the apostles you see, I believe that when God created mankind, the Bible lets us know that there is a vacancy within the heart of every person. And that vacancy is a longing for the Lord. Unfortunately, millions and billions of people do not grasp that vacancy and why it's there. Let me tell you, people have a vacancy there in their heart. They feel helpless, they feel hopeless, they feel meaningless, and unless you know Jesus as your personal Lord and Savior, that vacancy is going to always be there. This morning, I want us to look at 1 John chapter 1, verses 1 through 4, and the question is this, do you know for sure that you know for sure that Jesus is real to you. 
Now, if you're keeping notes there in your bulletin, I have listed four reasons why John wrote this book to begin with. Number one is to resolve assurance. To resolve assurance. The second reason he wrote this little book is to refute error. To refute error. When I mentioned a few moments ago that 70% of professing Christians say that there are more ways to get to heaven than through Jesus, let me tell you, John would say, you've got it all wrong. You see, he was writing this little book to refute the error that was being taught in those days. Third reason that John wrote this book was to restrain sin, to restrain sin. And the fourth reason that he wrote this little book was to restore joy, to restore joy. Let me tell you, John, the apostle, known in the Bible as the beloved, he was in Jesus' inner circle. He knew Jesus personal. They were great friends. John would be the last of those disciples. He would be exiled on an isle of Patmos out there in the Aegean Sea for his faith in Christ Jesus. He would be that apostle that would write the book of John. We all say John 3, 16. This is the guy I'm talking about. He also wrote three little books, 1 John, 2 John, 3 John, and he also wrote the last book in the Bible, the book of Revelation. I want you and me to listen in this morning on his testimony about what he thought of Jesus Christ. Notice, if you will, in 1 John chapter 1, verse 1 through 4, that which was from the beginning, which we've heard, which we have seen with our eyes, which we have looked upon, and our hands have handled concerning the word of life. The life was manifested, and we have seen and bear witness and declare to you that eternal life, which was with the Father and was manifested to us, that which we have seen and heard, we declare to you that you also may have fellowship with us. And truly, our fellowship is with the Father and with his Son, Jesus Christ. And these things we write to you that your joy may be full that your joy may be full. You see, a testimony is something that you know personally about and you begin to share that. The book of 1 John, it's written to strengthen people that are Christians. I believe that when the church is strengthened, when believers are strengthened in their faith, that God can use that church, that God can use that believer to shape a world for Jesus Christ. I believe the great need today in the church for believers is to become established in the Word of God and to know Jesus as a reality in their daily life. I want to give you those four reasons, once again, that John wrote this book. He writes the book to resolve assurance. In 1 John chapter 5, in verse 13, John says, These things I have written to you who believe in the name of the Son of God that you may know that you have eternal life and that you may continue to believe in the name of the Son of God. There are a lot of people today that don't know whether or not they have eternal life. I hear people say all the time, oh, well, I, I think I do, I hope I do. Folks, let me tell you, there's no think about it, there's no hope about it. You either do or you don't. You either know Jesus as your personal Lord and Savior or you don't. John writes this book to help you understand that if you have repented of your sins, if you have turned in faith to Jesus Christ, then you are saved and you have eternal life and you have that 
assurance. Let me ask you a question this morning. All over the world today, you and I could go out with a microphone. We could interview people wherever we are, and we could ask them, do you know Jesus as your personal Lord and Savior? They would have to give you an answer of either yes, no, I'm not sure. And so this morning, I want you to be sure. I want us to be sure. Do you have eternal life this morning? At least 30 times in five chapters, John uses the word no. He writes for assurance. You and I are living in a day of doubt. We live in a time of skepticism. When the whole spirit of our world is, well, you really can't know anything. There's nothing that you can really nail down. There's no person who really demands our trust in our faith. You cannot trust anyone. Now, that's how people all over the world feel this morning about things. Yet the Bible tells us that there is absolutely something that we can know for sure. We can know beyond any shadow of a doubt that we have eternal life through God's Son, Jesus Christ. Now, maybe some of you do not know that this morning. Maybe some of you do not have that assurance. You hope you do, uh, or you know it, but right now you just uh, are questioning uh, your doubts about that assurance. I want to say to you this morning, don't leave this place today without the blessing of knowing beyond a shadow of doubt that you have resolved in your heart that I know Jesus Christ. John not only wrote the book to uh, resolve uh, assurance, secondly, he wrote the book to refute error. Notice in 1 John chapter 2, verse 26, these things I have written to you concerning those who try to deceive you. Now, the devil has always been in the business of deceiving people and deceiving Christian people and trying to draw them away from Christ. There are all kinds of seducing demonic spirits in this world this morning. People that would try to take you away from Christ. People that would try to uh, uh, shatter your faith in Jesus. So John says, I'm writing in other words, to fortify yourselves against those false teachers. And so he writes to refute error. Thirdly, he writes this book to restrain sin. 1 John 2 verse 1, he says, My little children, these things I write to you so that you may not sin. And then notice what John goes on and says. And if anyone sins, we have an advocate. Young people, do you know what an advocate is? It's someone that goes in your defense, someone that goes for you. And if anyone sins, we have an advocate with whom? The Father, Jesus Christ, the righteous. You see, young people, church, whenever we sin and fall short of the glory of God, and we have trusted Christ, but we still live in a sinful fleshly body that Satan comes against and temptations come uh, against us. Let me tell you, uh, Jesus said there's a way to make escape of the temptation. To be tempted is not sin. It's the yielding to the temptation that is the sin. And let me tell you, as long as you and I are in this world, we are not safe in this world. You may be saved, but you're not safe. Satan will do everything in his power to try to deceive you, to try to distract you, to try to throw you off course, to try to get you to sin. And young people, I want you to know, the devil is alive and well. Let me tell you, one of the ways he keeps people uh, away from Christ uh, is that you know, people have this idea, well, you know, I can't be a Christian because I can't live the perfect life. And, and preachers, someday when I feel that I can live that life, then I'll trust Jesus as my personal Lord and Savior. Folks, I want you to know none of us, 
that have ever received Jesus in our heart, we can't live the Christian life. We have to let him live it through us. And let me tell you, we're all humans, and sometimes we do falter and sin. And the Bible says we have an advocate with the Father. You know what that means, kids? It means that I can just talk to Jesus myself. I can just say, Jesus, I sin. Please forgive me of that sin. Let me tell you, you don't have to come down to the pastor's office. I don't have to sit in a little booth and you confess your sins to me for uh, me to absolve you of the sin. Let me tell you, we have an advocate and he is Jesus Christ this morning. Aren't you grateful that when he went back to heaven, he sat down at the right hand of the Father where the Bible says that he ever lives to make intercession, intercession for the saints. He's praying for you and me this morning when we don't even know how to pray. And I don't know about you, but there are a lot of days I don't know how to pray. I just say, Lord, help me today. Lord, I know you're praying. Lord, whatever your will is. Thank you, Father, that you're interceding for me today. He wrote that fourth reason uh, to restore joy. Look in 1 John 1, 4. And these things we write to you, why? That your joy may be full. Did you realize that God wants your Christian life to be a life of joy? He wants it to be a life filled with happiness. He wants to fellowship with you. And when you and I worship here at New, New Hope, let me tell you, I noticed a few moments ago when you were turning and shaking hands with each other and I could hear uh, the talking and the laughter and the joy and the shaking of hands, that's fellowship. And let me tell you, a church that has the joy of the Lord, I believe will be a strong church, a growing church. I believe it will be a healthy church. And so those are the four reasons that he wrote the book, Resolve Assurance, Refute Error, Restrain Sin, and Restore Joy. Let me tell you, it doesn't mean that you and I will not sin, but it does mean we will sin less. Let me tell you, there are three takeaways for this morning. In your bulletin, number one, Jesus is the Christ of reality. John 1.1, 1, 1, he's the Christ of reality. Is he real to you this morning? John said, that which was from the beginning, which we have heard, we've seen with our eyes, which we have looked upon and our hands have handled concerning the word of life. Notice that phrase, the word of life. Jesus is the word of life. He's saying that Jesus is the communication regarding life. If you want to know about life, look at Jesus. That Jesus is the exegesis of God. He's the explanation of God. Jesus articulates God's command. So if you want to know about the love of God, look at Jesus. If you want to know about the compassion of God, look at Jesus. If you want to know about how to get to God, look at Jesus. If you want to know anything about God, look at Jesus Christ, the Son of God, for he is the word of life. He is the Christ of reality. Now, John tells us that Christ is real in three dimensions. Now, these are not there in your bulletin, but let me give you the three dimensions that Christ is real. Number one, Christ is real eternally. That which was from the beginning. Christ is real eternally. John tells us that Jesus was God and that before the world was flung into space, uh, before any of this ever existed, before the world was created, Jesus was coexistent. Jesus was co-eternal with God the Father, that Jesus Christ was God. He was real eternally. And then John tells us, secondly, that Jesus Christ was real historically. Young people, let me tell you, notice this phrase, which we have seen with our eyes, which we have looked upon 
and our hands have handled concerning the word of life. Young people this morning, historically, Jesus was a real person that lived and walked upon the face of the earth. He was as real a person as George Washington was, or Abraham Lincoln was, or you or, you or I. You see, in that day and time, if they had had modern technology like you and I have today, we would have seen in real time the miracles of Christ. We would have seen his sacrificial death on the cross. We would hear his voice being heard. He was a man who actually walked and talked and walked the dusty roads in the Holy Land, in the city of Jerusalem, and around that area. John said, I heard the voice of Jesus when Jesus cried out at the tomb of Lazarus. And Jesus cried out, come forth, Lazarus. There John heard Jesus' voice when Jesus cried out that day on the cross, te telestai, which means it is finished the work was done. John was there. John heard the voice of Jesus. When Jesus said to the disciples after the resurrection, as he's making his ascension, he said, go ye into all the world. John heard the voice of Jesus. Let me ask you a question this morning. If Christ is real in your life, then you will hear the voice of Jesus, uh, it's a sign you're a child of God. I'm not speaking about an audible voice, but I'm speaking about what you hear through the Holy Spirit, the voice of Jesus with the ears of your soul, uh, with the ears of your heart, with the ears of your spirit. You will hear Jesus speak to you if you know him as your personal Lord and Savior. And then he says this other dimension, not only is uh, he real eternally, not only is he real historically, but he says Christ is real personally. Look at John 1.1, 1, 1. we have seen with our eyes. Young people, that means a steady gaze, a gaze of examination. He said, I've seen Jesus with my own eyes, and I've gazed upon him. I've examined his work. I've looked upon him. You see, John saw Jesus as he walked on the Sea of Galilee. He saw Jesus when he called the disciples. He saw Jesus as he reached out to the multitudes and fed the thousands, as he reached out to those that were lame and caused them to be able to walk. Those who were blind, he touched them and caused them to be able to see. John saw as paralytics were delivered. He saw as demoniacs were relieved of those demonic spirits. And, and John is saying, I've witnessed this. You see, if you're saved, the Bible teaches you will see Jesus. You'll see what he does in your life. You'll see the hand of God in your family. You'll see Christ who can make a difference in your home. If you know Jesus, you will see him with your eyes. John tells us he handled him. I touched him. Let me tell you, if you know the Christ of reality, he's someone that you can reach out and touch this morning. Secondly, this morning in your outline, Jesus is not only the Christ of reality, but Jesus, secondly, is the Christ of relationship. Notice verse 3. He mentions the word fellowship. That means to hold in communion. Fellowship is sharing together. And if you know Jesus, there's a fellowship with the family of God and, and with the uh, family of God's people this morning. John writes, John wants us to know that Jesus wants fellowship with you and me. How do we get into that fellowship? How do we get into the family of God? You have to be born again. You've got to be born again uh, when you come to Jesus in faith and you repent of your sins and the Holy Spirit comes into your heart and life. It, he places you into the family of God. Let me tell you, there's nothing you and I can do to earn salvation. It's strictly God's grace. It's a free gift to those that call 
on the name of the Lord. The Bible says there's fellowship in the Holy Spirit of God. Let me ask you, are you in God's family this morning? Fellowship with the family, fellowship with the Holy Spirit, fellowship with the Father. Notice in 1 John 1 verse 3, that which we have seen and heard, we declare to you that you also may have fellowship with us and truly our fellowship is with the Father and with the Son, Jesus Christ. Let me tell you, Jesus wants to have fellowship with you. In Revelation 3.20, Jesus said, Behold, I stand at the door and knock. If anyone hears my voice and opens the door, Jesus said, I will come in to him and dine with him and he with me. Let me tell you, Jesus wants to have fellowship with you this morning. Third and lastly, Jesus is the Christ not only of reality, not only the Christ of relationship and fellowship, but he is the Christ of rejoicing. Notice 1 John 1 verse 4, the phrase that your joy may be full. Let me tell you, the God of the Bible says, I want you to have a joy that's full. Now, young people, the world doesn't have that kind of joy this morning. Let me tell you how I know that, because if every second, if every second that we've been here this morning, every second, 200 people will get out their cell phones or their iPads, and they'll get on their search engine and they will type in, is God real? You know what that tells me? It's a world that is hungering, a world that is thirsting. As Sharon sang a few moments ago, when I couldn't come to him, he came to me. Let me tell you, he wants to come to the peoples of this world. Jesus is the Christ of rejoicing this morning. Let me tell you, the world does not have that peace today. Let me tell you, this world has pleasure, but it doesn't have the joy of Jesus. The Bible says, young people, there's pleasure in sin for a season. I'm not going to stand up here and tell you that sin is not fun. Because it is, or, or there wouldn't be so many people involved in sin. But the Bible says there's only pleasure in sin for a season. Let me tell you, all that the devil can give you, all the devil's trinkets that are out there, let me tell you, they don't glitter with, with gold forever. Let me tell you, the glitter of, of Satan's trinkets will dim and lose the pleasure that you think are there with them. Today, today the world has more entertainment, more things to do, more uh, recreation than any other generation, but yet the, this generation does not have joy. Empty faces, lonely people crying in the cities. The Bible says that at his right hand, there are pleasures forevermore. Let me tell you, joy will come when you know Jesus as your Savior. Let me give you three uh, ways you and I can have joy. It's there at the bottom of your outline in the uh, bulletin. We have joy in salvation. Let me tell you, the joy of the Lord is your strength. Isaiah chapter 12, verse 3 says, Therefore, with joy, you will draw water from the wells of salvation. We have joy in salvation. Secondly, we have joy in the Scriptures. Jeremiah 15, 16, Your words were found, and I ate them. And your word was to me the joy and rejoicing of my heart. What Jeremiah was saying, young people, is when I read your word, I ate them up. In other words, I devoured what was there. I took it in. I meditated upon it. I drew sustenance from your word. Thirdly, we have joy not only in salvation, not only in the scriptures, but we have joy in soul winning Proverbs 11, verse 30, the fruit of the righteous is a tree of life, and he who wins souls is wise. You want to be wise this morning? Let me tell you, there's nothing like the joy 
of leading someone to faith in Jesus Christ. Let me ask you a question. Have you ever led anyone to Jesus? Let me tell you, there's nothing like the joy of knowing Jesus as your personal Lord and Savior. Have you ever told someone about Jesus? Have, have you watched the transformation take place in someone's life when you tell them about the source of life? And that source of life is Jesus. In closing, let me give you this illustration. I read about a little boy. A little boy who was somewhat homeless. He was ragged. He was hungry. And he was walking down the street one day. He saw some things happening in a storefront window to which the sign on the outside read the rescue mission. It was cold. He put his little face up against the window and he saw the rescue mission serving food. A man saw him, walked out the door and asked the little boy to come in and sit down and he filled him a plate full of food. But the little boy just sat there. He didn't pick up his fork and spoon to eat. He sat there and he began to weep. The man was surprised and looked at him and he said, son, I thought you would dig in as soon as you saw that food because you're so cold and hungry. Aren't you hungry? The little boy said, oh yes, sir. I'm, I'm very hungry, all right. But he said, the problem is, when I think about my little buddies out there in the streets that are as hungry as I am, I can't enjoy eating this food knowing they don't have any to eat themselves. Let me ask you a question. How hungry are you to see lost people saved? How hungry are you to tell someone today about Jesus? How hungry are you to know that you've led somebody to a place someday called heaven and not to a place called hell? I don't know about you, but when I get taught the Sunday school lesson here in the sanctuary this morning, I could not help but think, dear Lord, how can it be? How can it be that 70% of people who say they're Christian, that they know Jesus, how can they believe that there's more ways to get to heaven than one? Let me tell you, as the Sunday school lesson bore out this morning, if that were true, then why did Jesus die on a cross to shed his blood for the remission of sins? Let me tell you, young people, as you grow up and in this ever-changing world that you and I live in that is ever-changing and ever-challenging, if you're going to navigate through life, you've got to know that you know that you know that Jesus is real to you. Jesus said, I'm the way, I'm the truth, I'm the life. No man comes to the Father except through me. Would you stand? <clears throat> Father God, this morning we've thrown the news and um, that's what you called us to do. This invitation is yours and yours alone, Holy Spirit of the living God. I pray that you would move within people's hearts, those that are listening by radio, through the internet, television, those that are, will tune into this broadcast on YouTube. I pray, oh God, that the world will see that we want them to have the Jesus we know in our hearts, to have eternal life, and to have joy. Oh God, when I read that every 40 seconds someone in this world takes their life. Oh God, it's a world that is hopeless, helpless, and meaningless without the Lord Jesus Christ. 
Father, someone needs to come and receive you this morning. Speak to their heart. Someone needs to come and join this church. May they come this morning. If there are people that just need to come down to these altars and pray for someone or about something, speak to their heart, I pray in Jesus' name.